in uh, in your book on on William, you mentioned at one point that uh, in the last uh, approximately fourteen years of his life, William spent somewhere around twenty five percent of the time in England. So. Um, we were talking about the these uh, individuals that he trusted to act in in his behalf, uh, Matilda Odo, and you also mentioned Len Frank, uh, the Archbishop of uh, of Canterbury from 1070, if I recall correctly. Who was this clergyman? For people who aren't necessarily familiar with this uh, this in, uh, important uh, figure, who was he, and uh, what made him such an essential member of the king's inner inner circle? Uh, well, uh, Lan Frank is in, indeed very important. Um, he uh, he he came from Italy, originally from northern Italy, uh, um, and seems in his youth probably, or this is what we're told, um, you know, went through some kind of spiritual crisis uh, and became a monk. Uh, well, he originally probably came to Arpach or Mont Saint Michel. Then became a monk at Beck or the Beck, um, you know, and then became well, prior at the Beck and then abbot of William's monastic foundations and Saint Etienne of Caen, um, yeah, and and then Archbishop of Canterbury. He was also there was an attempt to make him Archbishop of Rouen, which uh, William managed to stop and Lanfranc himself stopped. Um, yeah, I mean he. Uh, he comes over as someone who um, has, because of his interna international reputation as a scholar, and there's a bit of debate about the nature of that, but we can leave that to one side. Uh, but he comes over as someone with, who is known to the papacy, who is trusted by seemingly many people, and um, you know, must have been... You know, a very skillful political operator. Uh, it's very, you know, so much of his cor the surviving correspondence is, of course, connected with religious subjects. But but it's noticeable that when Lanfranc is dealing on William's behalf with the revolt in, in England of William Fitzosman's son and two other, well, a, a wealthy of the last surviving English earl and one other, um, one, one other earl, the Breton, Breton, it's notable that Lanfranc's initial purpose is to try to negotiate, the uh, initial way of dealing with the situation is to try to negotiate. Um, you know, so I think we're dealing with someone who was probably subtle and intelligent, who knew how to work with William. Uh, and and who again supplied, as did these other figures, um, qualities which supported the regime. It, it is very. It it strikes me, and um, it, it strikes me as as you write the book that there is this very small group: Lanfranc, Odo until ten eighty two, uh, William Fitzosborne, Matilda. Roger de Beaumont, who is very interesting for lots of other reasons, Roger de Montgomery, this very small group who were with William throughout his lifetime, or with the exception of William Fitzosman, of course. You know, it's almost as if there's a political group who have qualities which are able to make the regime work. You know, so I hope that in some ways portrays Lamprank. Yeah, you know, I mean there were other churchmen who were also very important. The Archbishop of York, Thomas of Bayeux, must have been, because you know, William. I mean, you you, you cite the statistic of um, uh, only twenty five percent, and I think that figure is a bit too high. Twenty five percent of time spent in England. Um, I mean, but, but actually, th this means that um, William is very dependent upon others. And it is notable of just how loyal, supportive, and proactive the, these other people are. You know, talking about a, a clergyman, and uh, you know, inevitably we can um, turn our eyes uh, to the uh, the church. In Normandy, William opted to have this sort of you know conservative approach when it came to the the church. Were there any major changes uh, in his relation to the church after 1066 that you observed? 
Um, what I think is, um, to me, there, there are signs of some changes in his attitudes before 1066. Um, there is um, the appointment of Marilius as Archbishop of Rouen, in 1055, who uh, Marilius was of course a monk, uh, you know, and not a member of the, um, not a member of the ducal family, as several of the, of the bishops were, or indeed of other aristocratic families. Ditto Lanfranc, of course, uh, came from a, a monastic background. Um, the first bishop appointed in England, Remigio, Remigius, Bishop of Lincoln, was also from a monastic background. Um, you know, so we're looking, I think, at a man who um, did value qualities which we could call religious, which we must call religious, uh, you know, who, who at the same time valued secular leadership. And um, in, in, all of the, in the case of all of these, and Odo obviously and Geoffrey of Coutance also come to mind, uh, you, you are looking at people who actually are able to um, fulfil religious roles uh, and also political ones. Uh, and it, it, it does actually suggest on William's part a, um, what I was looking for here, can't, the words I'm trying to find, uh, yeah, it, it does actually suggest a capacity to, to an awareness both of his role as a religious ruler, as a, as a, which is enshrined by his coronation oath, and also a man who has to exercise power, and sometimes, very often, power by force. You know, so, yeah. Well, I, um... it, 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 it to me is in it, it is in the end the uh, you know the, uh, the 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 problem of understanding by William and uh, grapple with this many times as a biographer. Uh, the problem of uh, understanding just how someone can be so demonstrably religious, um, and remember the story of his prostration between before Archbishop Eldred and before uh, the before the, the, the before the Cluny, Abbot of Cluny, um, you know, who can be demonstrably religious and also ex also extremely violent. You know, and it's it's a commentary on the man, but also on his time. Well, you you made reference to uh, to Odo uh, Williams' half brother uh, several times, and uh, yeah, I think he's the uh, the subject of uh, one your uh, one of your books that will be out soon, isn't he? Uh, well, he's the subject of a book I'm hoping to write. Yes, I'm I'm in the process of writing. And he was the subject of my PhD thesis. <laughs> you know, could you, could you, you please give us a brief um, overview on Otto's life and personality? Because I would say to the vast majority of the people, you know, he seems to be a little bit more obscure than other uh, personages that we uh, we talked about uh, today. Yes. Well, he, he, he yes, he, he is strangely obscure because, um, you know, well, the... the no one wrote a life of him. I mean, he didn't, William of Poitiers he didn't, he didn't have the equivalent of William of Poitiers. Um, you know, no one, you know, so, and, and, and the Bayer tapestry and his involvement with that in many ways complicates the issue as much as it clarifies it. Um, what I think I'd, uh, I, I, you know, he has, what I would emphasize is that, is that. A lot of writers, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, Audric, uh, Jocelyn Saint-Bertin, who is a hagiographer, all describe Odo as being secundus a rege, second to the king, um, conveying the impression of a uh, uh, almost a deputy or a, a regent at, at times. Uh, but when you actually look in, think of this in formal terms, uh, there isn't much evidence for that, although it does surface from time to time in judicial decisions which, which, which he took. So I'm suspecting that we're dealing with, and going back for a moment to 
the mistreat, you know, the, the mutilation of the citizens of Alençon. Um, this is William's loyal, this is William, he's punishing them because of the insult to his mother. Uh, and, and I almost think that, let's say, family mattered for William in, in a very important way. And it also must have mattered for Odo. And they go along seemingly contentedly, although because we don't have any record of any conversation. <laughs> Uh, they seem to go along in collaborating until Odo got involved in this scheme to buy the papacy for himself. Um, what is also remarkable, and you as a living in buyer will know, uh, you know, Odo is responsible for so many things in, in Bayeux. You know, the, well, he didn't start the new cathedral, that was done by his predecessor, Bishop Hugh, who we, we often underestimate. Uh, but great expansion of the cathedral chapter, um, new cathedral dedicated in 1077, um, building of a Episcopal palace, uh, formation of a school, foundation of the monastery of Saint Vigor of Bayeux, um, interaction in Kent with the St. Augustine's Canterbury and also with Lanfranc. Um, you know, around the bio tapestry and other things, the sheer energy and range of interests and connections of the man. Um, well, he he feels like a to me like a um, an international figure. You know, who um, without us quite being able to pin down the personal qualities which. Um, uh, which created this, which, which were central to this.